Well, hello, good afternoon, and good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Jeremy Leffler, and I work in the Policy Office in the Division of Institution and Award Support at the National Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to uh, another installment of our Spring 2022 NSF Virtual Grants Conference. I'm now pleased to present this session, which is an update to proposal and award policies and procedures. And this session it will be presented by Gene Feldman, who is head of the policy office at NSF. Well, welcome to the proposal and award policy update at the Spring 2022 NSF Grants Conference. You've already had sessions about proposal preparation, merit review, and award and administration. This session, however, is a bit different in nature in that I will be describing some proposed upcoming changes to NSF's policies and procedures that will be very useful for you in your uh, interactions with the National Science Foundation. So next slide, please. So my name is Jean Feldman. I am head of the policy office in the Division of Institution and Award Support and we are located in the Office of Budget, Finance, and Award Management. I do have a, an email address on this slide, and I would encourage you to use it after this conference is over if you had burning questions that you didn't get answered so that we can make sure you have a complete understanding of how to deal with NSF and how to write that next great proposal. Next slide, please. So the topics that I will be covering in this session include um, a new draft of the proposal and award policies and procedures guide. You've heard about that already, the PAP guide. Only this new version will be NSF 23-1. I will be talking about the anticipated timeline, what the proposed changes are, um, and then move to a different topic that will be of interest to all of you, and it will be NSF's implementation of National Security Presidential Memorandum 33 on research security. And then I will end with a final slide on getting ready for the transition, the full transition to research.gov. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the proposed um, timeline for the next version of the proposal and award policies and pr procedures guide or the PAP guide. Where are we and what is our timeline? At NSF, we use the Federal Wide Paperwork Reduction Act or PRA process for short, that's run by the Office of Management and Budget Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs to formally clear this document. This process requires a formalized 60-day standard to obtain public comment on all of the changes that we propose to make, resolve any comments that we receive prior to our agency implementation, and then finally get our final approval from OMB um, to move forward. Now, typically these PRA clearances are for a three-year period, but to ensure our policies and procedures are up to date, we annually go through this revision process. So as you can see, the 60-day comment period began on April 13th, and it concludes very, very shortly on June 13th. So there is still an opportunity to review the changes. Um, we have the document on our website, has all of the changes highlighted in yellow with a bubble that shows what the nature of the comment is. And if you want to provide any comments or feedback, you want to follow the instructions in the Federal Register to provide your comments to NSF. Now, as I've already mentioned, after we've received all of the comments from the community, as well as those internal to NSF, we do work to address those comments, every single one of them, prior to sending to OMB for final approval. Now, we are targeting October 2022 
for issuance on the NSF website with the January 2023 implementation time. That provides a 90 day period from issuance to implementation that gives you the opportunity, that gives the institutions opportunities to train your staff and faculty on the major changes. And it gives you any opportunity, an opportunity to make any necessary changes that will be needed for your systems to ensure compliance with these new or modified policies. This PAP guide will become effective in January 2023, which is the same timeline for moving from Fastlane to research.gov for proposal preparation and submission. And we want to ensure our guidance is written in such a way that is consistent with this major change. Now, I will tell you that this year's PAP guide is particularly challenging as we are working to implement a number of foundation-wide changes and at the same time trying to implement our NSPM 33 implementation guidance. And so I'm going to go into detail uh, in a little bit on slides of how and what that's going to actually mean to each and every one of you. Next slide, please. Now I am going to touch base on the most, what I would consider the high profile proposed changes to the PAP guide. So what you'll see is that, again, the draft PAP guide that's linked in the Federal Register includes all of the changes, not just those listed on these slides in a very digestible format. And it does have many proposed changes and clarifications. And we're, we want to make sure you're aware of all of them so that you know if it's something that you would be interested in making a comment on. So this is going to aid you in going through the document should you choose to do so. So what's the first change? Well, this is very big change at NSF. And we are transitioning from Fastlane to research.gov. Now, I was here in 1994 uh, when we first issued um, the fast lane to the research community. It was a huge change. Prior to that, people were submitting paper proposals to NSF. We finally transitioned in, 20, um, in 2000 to requiring use of Fastlane. So we're now at a point where we are ready to move from this age system to research.gov. Now, in accordance with important notice 147, which was dated September 22nd, 2020, NSF included for the first time a date by which the foundation would no longer accept proposals in Fastlane. And the community had been asking for this date for many, many years. So the important notice specified by the end of 2022 as the date proposal preparation in Fastlane would cease to exist. The draft PAP guide has been revised to remove Fastlane as a submission option for any new proposal submitted or due on or after the implementation of the new PAP guide in January of 2023. But it is really, really important to emphasize that active proposals that were originally submitted in Fastlane prior to this implementation date will continue to be available to the proposer for use in submission of proposal file updates and any necessary budgetary revisions for a limited period of time. We don't want you to have to start over um, in research.gov, but all new proposals will be required to be submitted in research.gov in January uh, of 2023. I talk a little bit more at the end of the presentation about research.gov. NSF in this version of the PAC guide is also incorporating a new type of funding opportunity with NSF's use of the broad agency announcement 
or BAA, and use of a new system, the BAA management system, to submit those proposals. Now, BAAs are currently used by other agencies to solicit research proposals. The term BAA refers to a solicitation method used by NSF for basic and applied research, scientific study, and experimentation. Unless otherwise specified, NSF can choose to fund proposals submitted in response to a BAA as grants, cooperative agreements, contracts, or other arrangements. BAAs are broad in their subject matter and focus on advancing science rather than acquiring specific product. There's more information in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, FAR Part 35016. We have rolled out a new vehicle for submission of a proposal in response of the BAA, again, the BAA Management System, or BAM. This provides an additional new type of funding opportunity that NSF can use to solicit proposals, and it becomes particularly important with, um, with an NSF's announcement of the new TIP directorate. So now I'm going to talk about concept outlines. Um, some NSF proposal types or funding opportunities may require submission of a concept outline in advance of submission of a full proposal. Examples of this include planning, rapid, eager, and raise funding types where you are required to be in touch with the program officer prior to submitting the proposal. The primary purposes of requiring a concept outline are to ensure that the concept that is being proposed by the prospective PI is appropriate for the proposal type or funding opportunity and helps to reduce the administrative burden associated with submission of a full proposal. Concept outlines are submitted by the prospective PI or will be submitted by the prospective PI via use of something called the PROSPECT tool. PROSPECT stands for Program Suitability and Proposal Concept. PROSPECT consists of a dashboard and web form for prospective PIs to prepare, send, and track the status of their submission. PROSPECT users must, must have a valid login.gov account to access the tool. Now, this is the first time in a very long time that we have had this many changes to uh, the PAP guide in, in the way of changes to eligibility. So we are making uh, changes in this uh, uh, version, next version of the PAP guide to the following eligibility categories for-profit organization. Um, for-profit organizations were already um, uh, eligible to submit proposals, but the guidance in the PAP guide was revised to highlight the new types of partnerships and that such organizations may be eligible for proposal submission. So we really, if you want to engage with uh, in your proposal, in partnering with a for-profit uh, entity, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at that section to see what the specific eligibility right requirements state. We are changing um, our eligibility requirements for state and local governments. The state and local government section was revised to permit submission of proposals when programmatically necessary and when specified in a solicitation or a broad agency announcement. Again, this may be uh, a very uh, new eligibility requirement that's particularly pertinent to our new TIP directorate. We've also added a completely new section about tribal governments and their eligibility to submit proposals to NSF. 
Now, this is a bit different than our proposals submitted by tribal colleges and universities, particularly to our TCUP program. These are truly um, proposals that are submitted by tribal governments themselves. And we have been doing a lot of outreach to the tribal government community to make them aware that they are eligible to submit um, proposals and uh, encourage you and your thinking to think about uh, possible partnerships with the tribal government community. So we've also added a clarification to eligibility for unaffiliated individuals. Um, that if you are unaffiliated individuals are typically not eligible to submit a, a proposal to the National Science Foundation. But we wanted to make it very clear that proposers that are submitting to postdoctoral fellowship pro programs are not considered unaffiliated and are very much eligible to submit um, proposals to NSF. Now I'm going to talk about a very new proposed supplementary document that you may be very interested in hearing about. And it's called uh, the Plan for Safe and Inclusive Field, Vessel, and Aircraft Research, um, PSI-FBAR, but we're calling it the PSI for short. Um, given that field research is a necessary component of many, many STEM fields, so, such field work um, does present some unique challenges that can increase the likelihood of harassment, including but not limited to challenging physical conditions, social isolation, and limited communication methods. So NSF states that all research should be done in an environment that is free from harassment. This fundamental principle is not new at NSF. We have been tackling this issue through issuance of a term and condition, through um, changes to the BAP, PAP guide in the way of conference and travel proposals, in new funding opportunities, and now the PSI. Each proposal that proposes to conduct research in the field, including on research vessels and aircraft, must include a PSI as a supplementary document. A limitation of two pages for the PSI has been established. This new coverage in the PAP guide identifies NSF's expectations, as well as the content requirements for this supplementary document. And literally the format um, that we have identified goes into very specific detail about the background information that you're going to, to um, provide, the preparation for field work section that you're going to provide, and provides very specific details that I would strongly encourage you to read about in the proposed version of the PAP guide because it will have huge future implications for any research researcher that does this very specific type of research. Now, next slide, please. Now, we are also making a number of changes to um, the biographical sketch and current and pending support documents. Now you've already heard about the biographical sketch and current and pending support in um, the proposal preparation section. And as a reminder, the biographical sketch is used to assess the qualifications of the individual or team to carry out the proposed research. And that current and pending support is used to assess capacity of the individual to carry out that research, as well as any overlap or duplication with the project being proposed um, versus all of, of what their other current and pending support currently is. 
But we are making uh, and continue to make changes to these sections. And I'm going to talk about them right now, what we plan to do. Um, in the biographical sketch, the professional preparation requirements has been revised to increase our standardization. We have continued to work very, very closely, and I'm going to talk about this in our uh, upcoming slides on our NSPM 33 implementation, with standardizing with our colleagues at the National Institutes of Health. We both have very um, specific requirements for submission of the biographical sketch. And we want to ensure that we are as standard as eyes as possible because we want to el eliminate to the extent possible any administrative burden associated with figuring out, OK, I'm dealing with NSF now. I have to prepare the biosketch this way. I'm dealing with NIH now. I have to submit the biosketch that way. So we really understand the implications and the administrative burden associated with agencies having very, very specific um, formats that differ significantly from one agency to another. And so we are doing everything possible to address that. But the biggest change by far is that the biosketch and current and pending support documents will now be required beginning in January 2023. They must be prepared in Science CV. The static PDF formats that are available now on the NSF website will no longer be an option. This is done be, being done because of the requirement um, in the National Defense Authorization Act um, of 2021, Section 223, that requires that senior personnel will have to certify that their biosketch is accurate, current, and complete. Again, this certification will begin in January of 2023. And the certification will be done upon download and will be um, printed on the forms. We are also um, adding uh, fields or uh, in encouraging you to add your ORCID ID. Um, the ORCID ID in Science CV will help with pre-population of information that's already available in your ORCID format to the biosketch, as well as to current and pending support. So this is a very, very important encouragement that we are hoping will, you will use to assist with that pre-population and elimination of administrative burden. Now, let me talk about a couple of specific changes to current and pending support. Again, we are uh, continuing and increasing standardization. I'm going to talk about that a bit more in the NSPM 33 implementation section. Um, but one of the biggest changes to this sec uh, section is that um, we now will be requiring that current and pending support be resubmitted prior to making a funding recommendation. Um, beginning in uh, uh, January of 2023. Now, let me fully recognize that some NSF divisions and directorates already have as a best practice that you must provide updated um, uh, current and pending support information. In January of 2023, this will move to a foundation-wide requirement. And then again, we have the same requirement to use Science CV and the same ORCID encouragement that we hope, again, will facilitate um, pre-population of these documents. Next slide, please. So here are some more additional proposed changes. 
uh, revision of goalie requirements. Goalie stands for grant opportunities for academic liaison with industry or goalie. This proposal type will be modified to permit non-SBIR STTR small businesses to receive funding from a goalie award. There are requirements that small businesses need to make to be eligible. In addition to the eligibility requirements, the size of the subaward to the small business partner must not exceed one third of the total award budget. And the proposal must disclose any financial interest that the PI, co-PI, senior personnel, and or the institution of higher education have in the small business partner and identify appropriate mitigation of any financial conflicts of interest. We have incorporated, incorporated a new section on research security. Uh, this new section on research security has been added to identify the purpose of research security and NSF, as well as NSF's research security initiatives. Uh, the coverage also highlights NSF's post-award disclosure requirements. This section is being issued in advance of the research security program requirement that is specified in uh, the NSF implementation guidance and that I will discuss in a few uh, slides. We also are implementing Build America, Buy America, and Made in America statutes. Now this is a federal wide uh, statute that was implemented on May 14th. So while there will be coverage in the upcoming PAP guide, the implementation of this requirement has already happened. We issued new sets of terms and conditions that incorporate the Build America, Buy America article. And what this basically specifies is that all iron, steel, manufactured products, and construction materials used in federally funded projects must be produced in the, in the United States. The awardee has to implement the requirements in its procurement procurements and the term and condition article has to flow down to all subawards and contracts at any tier. Again, you will see new coverage in our terms and conditions, such as the research terms and conditions, agency specific requirements, and our grant general conditions. Now we have also a new section on scientific integrity. Now coverage on scientific integrity is not at all new to the PAP guide. This added section now summarizes all of the expectations in the area of scientific integrity. All organizations and personnel supported by NSF are expected to uphold the highest standards for scientific integrity, which builds on key principles of honesty, objectivity, ethical behavior, transparency, and professionalism in the conduct of scientific activities in an inclusive environment that is conducive to excellence in research and education. Organizations and all individuals supported by NSF awards are reminded that the principles, expectations, and requirements that support scientific integrity are integral to multiple topics that are specified in the PAP guide, and we highlight in that section what those topics are. Now there are new check boxes on the proposal cover sheet or will be. One is for dual use uh, research of concern or potential life sciences, dual use research of concern. And that box must be checked if use of select agents or other enhanced poten uh, potential pandemic pathogens are envisioned and those agents or pathogens are used in ways that lead to enhancement of specific pro properties that are specified within the policy. And then the other new checkbox is for that plan for safe and inclusive field vessel aircraft research, which I've already talked about. And when you check that box, it will make sure that you have added that supplementary document pr prior to you being able to submit the proposal. Now I'm going to change gears here and talk about our implementation of NSPM 33 implementation guidance. 
Now, this is the cover page of the implementation guidance, and this is a report. NSPM 33 was issued a year ago in January of 2021, and it was uh, the um, National Security Strategy for U.S. Government Supported Research and Development. And we took a year, um, the past year, to put together the implementation guidance. So this is not guidance just for NSF. This is guidance that will apply to all federal research funding agencies. And so it is a topic that will be very important to all of you, regardless of whether uh, it's NIH, NSF, EPA, DOD, DOE, et cetera. So very useful uh, information on this section. Now, let me talk about the proposed changes um, in the way uh, of how we're going to implement NSPM 33. And again, we have these out for public comment. We encourage the community to tell us uh, what, if any, their concerns are with how NSF proposes to implement um, NSPM 33. NSPM 33's disclosure requirements um, NSF has been uh, collaborating with NIH, as I've previously mentioned, to see over the last three years where our agencies were consistent and where we were not on the biographical sketch and current and pending support formats. Then we began focusing on where the differences were and whether it was possible to mitigate or eliminate these differences. Uh, to help eliminate administrative burden. Now, it's really, really important for you to understand that what we've come up with in the way of standardized disclosures and the work done by NSF and NIH in the area of disclosures um, actually was used in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance, but we continue to build out that section because we realize the kinds of questions and the kinds of activities that you need to know whether to disclose and where in the proposal at our, are at a more granular level than the table that is included in the implementation guidance. So again, let me emphasize that what we're doing um, in the way of these uh, harmonizations uh, also is leading us, um, NSF, NIH, and OSTP um, all co-chair an interagency working group on disclosure policies. And so again, not only were the tables incorporated in NSPM 33, but we were also given the direction to develop a harmonized biographical sketch and current and pending support that could be used by all agencies um, uh, to obtain the biographical sketch and current and pending support. Now, I would will advise you that it's very important that you understand that both the disclosures and these new templates that when they are implemented will be essentially an 80% solution across all federal research funding agencies. It is simply can't be a 100% solution as the agencies have different statutory and regulatory requirements for the information that we collect. That's why it's so important to note that over the past couple of years, NSF has included in the PAP guide for each section of the proposal, what the purpose of that section is and what we're using it for. We absolutely want to be transparent in that respect. When you see what NSF is providing and what NSF and other agencies are providing, we have to emphasize those differences are due to statutory and regulatory requirements. And finally, there is an entirely new section in the PAP guide that talks about um, our proposed disclosure requirements. 
And we highlight that your disclosures appear in three areas, the biographical sketch, current and pending support, and collaborators and other affiliations. But it is vitally important that submission of disclosure information be taken seriously. And so that section of the PAP guide not only talks about what our expectations are, but what are the possible consequences um, if you fail to, uh, to uh, comply with these requirements. So it is super important. And as I've already mentioned before, beginning in January, both the current pending support and the biosketch will have um, certifications that the information is true, accurate, and complete. Next slide. Now, this slide is just an example of how NSF has implemented the NSPM 33 guidance. Um, we have been using it for some time. So we have had now five different versions of these, this document. And we believe this will be absolutely essential to you in preparation of your proposal and is usable now. Let me emphasize this. This slide is not something about future. It's about now. So when you're preparing your biographical sketch, when you're compare, uh, preparing your, uh, your uh, current and pending support, this will be instrumental. Down uh, the vertical are types of activities um, and across the horizontal is where you would put it in the proposal, either the biographical sketch, current and pending support, facilities, equipment, and other resources, project reports, post-award term and condition, and something absolutely essential, disclosure not required. And we continue to keep this up to date. And a table of this nature will ultimately be used by all federal research agencies to uh, uh, help you navigate uh, these disclosure requirements. We are definitely trying to remove administrative burden by making researchers aware of the parameters set by the agency. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about the initial disclosures and any update or correction requirements. The NSPM 33 implementation guidance encourages agencies to move to just in time in collection of current and pending support information. And before getting into the content of this slide, let me talk for a minute about just in time. We get a lot of questions as to why NSF doesn't use just in time for submission of current and pending support like NIH. But when you look at the agencies and compare our policies and review processes and the role of the program officer in this process, you'll really see that it's like comparing apples to oranges. NSF has now had numerous discussions with senior management over the years based on community input for a just-in-time solution, and we are in the process of revisiting this again. I can't tell you at this point how this discussion will play out. What I can say, though, is that you will not see a just-in-time solution for submission of current and pending support in the 2023 version of the PAP guide. There simply has not been enough information and we still have to continue to consider a number of policy and system related discussions before we could even consider implementation of just in time for submission of current and pending support at NSF. So what does the PAP guide say about when in the process NSF requires disclosure information? Well, it's at the time of proposal submission. So again, you'll continue to provide your collaborators and other affiliations, your biographical sketch and your current and pending support as you do now. But beginning in January of 2023, prior to making award, now let me emphasize that this may be less than 20% of the proposals that come in. And this is just for those that may be recommended for funding. 
will be required and requested by the Cognizant Program Officer to provide an updated current and pending support so that NSF can take a look to see whether the individual continues to have the capacity to work on the project now that we've had uh, time since submission of the initial proposal to NSF. NSF is looking at this capacity. We also look to see whether there is an impact on overlap or duplication. This will only be asked again prior to making an award for when an award is being considered. This is also not a guarantee if your Cognizant Program Officer asks for it, that an award will ultimately be made. NSF has been very proactive on the post-award side. We have been following the NSF implementation guidance of NSPM 33 and have essentially already implemented these requirements. So they are already in place. So after an award is made, uh, if the AOR discovers or the authorized organizational representative discovers that a disclosure that should have been submitted at the time of proposal preparation, but was not, they have 30 days to submit a post-award request to NSF. Um, in addition, at the time of project reporting, um, PIs and co-PIs beginning in 2020 have been required to specify whether new, active, other support has been received in their annual and final project reports. And if yes, they must attach an updated current and pending support submission uh, to uh, and attach it to um, your annual or final project report. Now, what is NSF looking at in these post-award discussions? Again, capacity overlap and duplication. But the process is that if one is submitted, the program officer will make an assessment of the impact on the project of this new information. They then send it to the Chief of Research Security Strategy and Policy, or the CRISP um, at NSF for a second look. And if the decision is made that there is an impact on capacity overlap and duplication, then NSF will have a discussion with our Division of Grants and Agreements and map forward with the institution our path, path forward. So we are currently in the process of developing a lot more internal outreach so that our own program officers at NSF better understand this process. NSF does require mandatory training on the biographical sketch and current and pending support as it relates to research uh, security. And we're developing even more outreach so that our program officers can better understand this process. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk finally about Goodbye Fast Lane. Hello research.gov. So I've already given a good introduction to this in the way of important notice uh, 147. And we will now be meeting that requirement of uh, that particular important notice by having uh, the transition away from Fastlane to research.gov. Now, currently about 80% of NSF funding opportunities are supported in research.gov. 80% and yet not 100%. That's because we still continue to add the last few areas of functionality that are necessary to complete that transition. And because we're looking at the deadlines for each funding opportunity and migrating when it could be done to ensure the research community has at least 90 days notice before removing Fastlane as an option. Now, currently, we are seeing about 46% of proposal submission come in through research.gov, and we want that number to climb higher by the end of the fiscal year. NSF strongly encourages the research community to make the transition earlier than later because this smooth transition for both 
um, the research community and for NSF will definitely be enhanced by more institutions and more faculty using research.gov. It also avoids the rush at the end, which would overwhelm the NSF help deck. And it can, you know, again, it also provides a, a necessary feedback loop that helps ident NSF identify any issues earlier rather than later. Now, there is a whole session on this during this conference, and I strongly encourage that you attend that session in order to find out more information. With that, that completes my, uh, the final part. There is one more slide. Uh, that just goes into some of the resources that have been referred to in this section. And I hope that you um, have found this information useful and look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time and attention. Okay, uh, we do have a little bit more time for questions. Uh, we've been answering questions uh, furiously in the in the Q and A session, and I want to thank my colleagues um, Beth Strausser and Samantha Hunter, uh, who are policy specialists in the policy office, for uh, for helping us to answer a lot of your questions. Um, the first question, Jean, I wanted to get to, we had some questions about the use of BAAs. So could you clarify a little bit the difference between BAAs and solicitations and how they're being used at NSF? Sure. Um, let me just start by, I, I did see that there were lots of questions. And so I wanted to make sure that this was a topic, number one, that we really just explained what we were doing here at NSF. So. Um, BAAs are actually a FAR mechanism, uh, broad agency announcements, and they are defined in the federal acquisition regulation, but they can be used as we've indicated in the new PAP guide language for grants, contracts, um, other arrangements uh, and the like. Um, and what we wanna do here is really, these are most heavily being used in areas where we are trying to attract new types of entities to apply to the National Science Foundation. So these are actually posted in SAM and these kinds of groups, for-profit organizations, for example, are used to seeing things uh, in SAM. And this permits us uh, to attract uh, these other types of entities. In addition, folks are clearly, well, research.gov, well, research.gov, well, many of these types that we are trying to appeal to, for-profit entities, state and local governments, uh, other types of small businesses, um, uh, foreign organizations are not necessarily um, used to using research.gov. Um, and so the BAM system is much more oriented towards folks that do not have this intimate knowledge with research.gov. So it is not absolutely by any stretch of the imagination going to replace research.gov. Rather, it is another vehicle that we can use when it's appropriate for NSF to do so. Great, thank you. The next part, next question is really a two-part question. And as I know you saw, we got a lot of questions about um, current and pending support and the certification process uh, that will be coming into effect, going into effect next year in January in Science CV. So the, the first question is, can one, it's more of a, can you talk a little bit more about that certification process um, of the biosketch and current and pending support in Science CV? The second part of that question is, um, why is NSF not currently using a just-in-time process for current pending support uh, like some other agencies uh, do, rather than asking for that, for that um, document uh, uh, more than once? Okay. Um, and, and both, let me just say to the audience, and yes, I uh, agree with Jeremy, got lots of questions in this space. So let me talk about um, the certification requirement and why, you know, why can't we just build it into research.gov? Well, first of all, research.gov only has submissions from the organization. So let's make that very clear. And the um, 
organization in terms of, of submitting uh, a proposal to the National Science Foundation. So authorized organizational representatives are identified with roles in research.gov and it lets them do so. So they provide the organization all certifications uh, when they submit that proposal. Well, when the National Defense Authorization Act of 2021, Section 223 was passed, it made a requirement that all covered individuals and by covered individuals, uh, not just NSF, but NSPM 33 implementation guidance defines that as senior key persons. So senior personnel in NSF parlance submitting those proposals. And it requires um, the uh, individual uh, that's senior personnel identified to submit um, their biosketch and current and pending support, um, and it be uh, certified that it's accurate, current, and complete. So we will still enable um, individuals to have that delegation function to fill out, but it's the actual download, meaning they're going to download it and attach it to an NSF proposal, can only be done by the individual that is actually making that certification. We will have standardized certification language uh, that will be used across the government. Uh, we, those of us that will be using Science CV, and that will be just not just NSF and NIH and DOE, um, and some programs in um, the Department of Education, but we will all having have that certification built into that process. So the individual will be able to provide those requisite certifications required by the National Defense Authorization Act. So um, again, a fundamental way that NSF can meet the statutory requirements because again, these are not organizational certifications. These are certifications provided by an individual. So when you go to the bigger issue of just in why um, not use just in time. Well, at the present time, um, as, as many of you know, and I tried to describe this in the piece of talking about our movement to use of Science CV, um, for the biographical sketch and current and pending support that um, NSF uh, understands and was actively engaged in development of the implementation guidance for NSPM 33, that there was a need um, for us, and it is in NSPM 33 implementation guidance, that you should be providing um, uh, an updated current and pending support to make sure that the individual has the capacity and there's not overlap duplication. Okay, so then we knew we had to get it um, again, even though it's a best practice prior to making an award. Well, we also at the present time use uh, uh, both the biographical sketch and current and pending support as part of the original proposal because our merit review criteria asks you to assess whether the individual team has the necessary qualifications to carry out the research as proposed and whether there's any overlap or duplication. So we will absolutely continue in 2023 of requiring the bio sketch um, and current and pending support at the time of proposal submission and get an updated current and pending support uh, for those uh, that are requested to do so prior to making that funding decision. We are currently assessing, this is the fourth time, fourth or fifth time, NSF has had this discussion over use of just-in-time at NSF. And yes, the, always, the agency we're always compared to is indeed NIH. Well, they have a very different review process. They have a Center for Scientific Review. We do not. They have a two-tier review process. We do not, uh, we do not, we have a one-tier. And so we still are figuring out whether NSF would have access to the information it needed um, uh, as part of the review process. Um, and those discussions are ongoing, but I can tell you there are very real and serious discussions 
As I mentioned before, I do not know how those discussions will turn out, but we are taking it obviously very serious and understand the administrative burden issue. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and as you mentioned, the draft PAP guide is going to require that proposals that include field work are going to require the use of a plan for safe and inclusive field vessel aircraft research. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about why NSF uh, is required is going to be requiring this, and does NSF have a definition for for field work? Well, we um, are. Uh, I happen to be um, on a team of NSF uh, uh, individuals, including representatives for all from all of our directorates. And this um, is a, a, a um, item of very significant importance at the National Science Foundation. And we are very actively trying to ensure that folks that do out to go out in the field um, are safe and um, that they are um, not being harassed in the conduct of the work that they're doing out there. And we really, the emphasis here is making sure that um, again, this field work is essential to many of the disciplines that NSF funds. And so it is extremely important that we feel that folks have given this significant thought before uh, going out to conduct this field research. And again, this was a, a very passionate discussion at NSF. We feel that these plans will make folks think about, you know, not only the background, what they're going to do and prepare to go out in the field, but think of things like ways that they can make it make the, the experience that is one that folks feel safe and feel like inclusivity has been factored in to um, what they propose to do. Now, the definition of field research, I saw the way the question was posed. Um, we are not considering students that go to a local restaurant and are off campus as field research. No, this is definitely leaving the campus environs and actually going into the field or doing work on vessels or work on aircraft that would be covered by this requirement. Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you again for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful day.